We've got a good word today. It's, it's all a good word because it's from the Lord. We're going to continue in the Gospel of Mark. And uh, we're moving into chapter 11. It's uh, titled Jesus' Triumphant Entry. And you know, I'll tell you the one thing that the Lord had put on my heart for this message. And we're going to get into the, the principle of, of, of um, binding and loosing and also bringing it. It's a third part that I think a lot of times that we overlook. Not just to bind, not just to loose, but to bring it. Learning to bind and loose and bring it will change your life forever. And that's important because in these seasons of transition, they always flow from barren to blessed. All transition seasons that we've been through, these seasons of obscurity through wilderness, they always flow from a sense of barren to blessed. And the key is to linger in whatever season you're in until one is launched into the next. You see, if you try to leave the season that you're in because you're just not comfortable with, with sitting in obscurity or sitting in wilderness, it doesn't mean that you're prepared to move into the flow of the next season of blessing and breakthrough. It is actually in that season of obscurity that you learn to grow in the faith that it's going to take to, to steward and shepherd that season of blessing. So I'll pray for this message, and then we'll stand for the anchor. So, Lord, Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the, for the season, Lord. We thank you for what's been an absolutely miraculous and abundantly blessed summer. Lord, we thank you for those, those days of, of cooler weather and rain. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come together as the body. We thank you for these special times to, to gather as the saints, as you, as you ask us to do, to not forsake the gathering. Because there is a special interaction when saints come together to equip one another, to encourage one another, to always lift it up you and worship you. So, Lord, I thank you for this message. I thank you for this good message, this opportunity to walk side by side with Jesus and the disciples. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We give all honor and glory to you in Jesus' yeah, name. Amen. 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 If we can stand together and read the anchor scripture for today, and, and it comes from Mark 1, uh, 1 through 11. We're going to read 1 through 10. So if we can begin, now when they drew near to Jerusalem to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and he said to them, Go into the village, village opposite you, and as soon as you have entered into it, you will find a colt tied in which no one has sat. Loose it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and immediately he will send it here. So they went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside on the street, and they loosed it. But some of those who stood there said to them, what are you doing, loosing the coat? And they spoke to them just as Jesus had commanded, so they let him go. Then they brought the coat to Jesus and threw their clothes on it and sat on it. And many spread their clothes on the road, and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. What a good, good word from the Lord. It is so wonderful to be able to walk through this gospel. You know, we've actually been in it for the last year. We started the gospel of Mark last August. It has been a wonderful opportunity to literally walk side by side with Jesus. To be one of the 13 in that little boat that crossed over to the, to the region of the Gadarenes. Do you remember that, that 24 feet wide, long, 7 feet wide boat that they all rode in? Do you remember being part of that when he encountered the demoniac? Do you remember walking into the, the synagogue right after he returned from the wilderness and being tempted by the devil? Remember when he was encountered by the possessed man. We have been through so much over the last year through the Gospel of Mark, walking side by side with Jesus and his disciples. 
And I'm going to tell you that starting today, starting today with this message, with Jesus entering into Jerusalem on a colt, which is a donkey, a baby that has not been ridden, we begin looking at the last week of Jesus' life on earth. I will tell you that this has been a hard, hard week to prepare this message. Knowing that we've drawn so close in this gospel of Mark, in this study. Knowing that today's message marks a turning point. From the time he arrives on a donkey, to when he's falsely accused and tried, to when he is beaten and crucified, it will be one week, the last week of Jesus' life on earth. What I want to tell you is that however it will take us to the end of the year to teach through this final week of Jesus' life. But I will tell you, it'll be worth it. Amen. The gospel message of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection is not something to ever, ever hurry through. Amen. So I want to start. We're going to walk through Mark 11.1. 1. Now, now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples. The Greek, the word drew near, is egizo. It means to approach, to be at the point of death, to offer him reverence and worship. You see, Jesus is approaching his death by coming near to Jerusalem. His sacrifice is his worship and reverence in doing God's will. In the Greek, the, the village of Bethpage, it's the house of unripe figs. Bethany in the Hebrew is house of affliction which is part of the Mount of Olives. I want to share an equipping moment. Think about Jesus before he, before he goes into Jerusalem. He is housed between a place of fruitlessness and a place of affliction. Would you say he's in a barren place? But he lingers until the right time. An equipping moment, church, when there seems to be no hope and no way out, and you find yourself stuck between fruitlessness, wilderness, obscurity, affliction. There's always Jesus. There's always Jesus. Jesus did not panic. He did not change locations. You see, Jesus was not buried in the barren. He was planted in the promise of God's glory. Spiritual fruit does not come from our circumstances, from our situations, or our current locations. The fruit comes from the living God, the Holy Spirit who resides within you. So Mark 11, 1, when it says, He sent His two disciples, we know that sent in the Greek is apostello. It means to send out a messenger to dispatch on some mission or service. What I will tell you is that in ancient Greece, when they would conquer a new territory, they would send out a team. The commander of that team was called the Apostolo. What they would do is they would dispatch a team, a unit, into the conquered territory, and they would teach them about government, about their religion, about their language, about their art and their architecture and their culture. You see, their apostello was so successful that ancient Greek culture still influences modern culture today. You see, this is what we're called to be. Apostles. Apostolo. We're called to be sent out to go into the world. You're called to be an apostle. The Great Commission is Jesus giving you His authority to act on his behalf. You see, when I was a, a, a police officer, before I became chief, well, when I was a chief of police, I was commissioned, duly, legally commissioned, to enforce the laws of the state and the country. Now, when I hired a police officer, I commissioned them. 
they had a little card. It's called their commission. That badge, that badge is just decoration. That badge didn't mean anything. Their authority, their legal authority, came from the commission that I gave them to act on my behalf. Why? Because I couldn't be everywhere all the time. When Jesus gives us his commission, this is our authority to act on his authority. When we move beyond his authority, beyond the Father's will, we're no longer acting under God's commission. But for that great commission to be fulfilled requires us to do what? To go out. Matthew 28, the great commission. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So God the Father has given Jesus the authority. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age." You have the supernatural authority, the legal authority. Jesus has commissioned you as kingdom officers, as kingdom deputies, as kingdom apostles to go out and share the good news of the kingdom. If you don't, who will? If not us, who? Remember, from a worldly side, The Greek culture remains current and relevant today. Why? Because of the apostolos, because of the teams that were sent out. You, your spouse, your family, this church, we are called as apostolos to go into a a new territory, to be conquered for the kingdom and share the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, to teach them all the things, if not us, who? Mark 11, uh, 11, 2 says, And he said to them, Go into the village opposite of you, and as soon as you have entered it, you will find a coat tied on which no one has sat. Loose it and bring it. Now, like I said earlier, coat is a young donkey that has never been ridden. The word tied in the Greek is dio. It means to bind, to imprison. You will find a donkey, a coat tied, imprisoned. The Greek word for door, tied to a door, is thura. It's an entrance, metaphorically, it's an opening, it's an occasion, it's an opportunity. Now, I want you to remember this. The door, thura, is an opening, an opportunity. When Jesus says, loose it, loose, it's luo, to set free, to set at liberty, to declare free. Now, this is an equipping moment that I want to just sit on for a second because I believe it is such an important revelation that the Lord gave me this week that I want to get it right. You see, Jesus, the teacher, he's always instructing. Like if you simply read over that scripture, you might miss the bigger picture. What Jesus is doing, he's not just talking about a cult tied to a door. Y'all go get it and bring it back. He's establishing the kingdom principle of binding and loosing. Go to Matthew 16. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. You see, that coat is bound to a door. What do keys open? Doors. In the Greek, door, thorough, is opportunity. The same Greek words for bind and loose are used in both scriptures. You see, that colt is bound to a door. Loose it. You see, when you go in Jesus' authority, you can set free what is already imprisoned and bound up. When you go in Jesus' authority. But this is what the Holy Spirit, Mark eleven two, the latter part says, Loose it and what? 
and bring it. Loose it and bring it. Church, what I will challenge this body is I believe we're okay with loosening. I don't think we follow through with the bring it. You see, Jesus just didn't say bind it and loose it. He said bring it. He said bring it. You see, how many times do we, do we stand firm and we come through a season of breakthrough? We're fighting these spiritual barriers. And then we come into a season of overflow. But we fail to bring it. So many times we, we bring our burdens to the foot of the cross. And we lay them before the feet of Jesus. And we get up and go back to our seat with the same burdens that we carried down. What I want to challenge you today is I want you to bind up debt and poverty right now in Jesus' name. I want you to bind up sickness and disease right now in Jesus' name. I want you to bind up fear and depression right now in Jesus' name. I want you to bind up oppression and suppressive spirits right now in Jesus' name. I want you to bind up everything not of God right now in Jesus' name. And I want you to loose the abundant flow of God's provision. Now, I want you to bring it with you into the next season. I want you to bring the abundant flow of God's provision. Be it joy, be it health, be it healing, be it peace, be it wisdom. I want you to bring that abundant blessing with you into the next season. I would venture to say so many times we lose the blessings of the Lord and we leave them where we found them. Do not be afraid to bring it. Be bold to bring it. This is a revelation from the Lord. And I just want to make sure. I want to embolden you to learn to bind up. I want you to learn to loose the goodness. And be bold to bring it. Mark 11, 3 says, And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it. And immediately he will send it here. When you go out under the authority of God, you go with the same jurisdiction because the Holy Spirit's within you. But you got to go out under the authority of God. There's no room in the kingdom for solo rogue actors. Autonomy is not biblical. Every New Testament church, every New Testament believer was connected to other believers and other churches. Everyone is held accountable. To be an apostle, Mark 11, 2 says, and he said to them, go into the village opposite of you. Here we go again. Go into the village opposite of you. Jesus is sending out and he's covering their actions. We are an equipping church. We're an Ephesian 4, 11, 12 church. We equip you to do the work of the ministry. But it requires covering. Now, God is the only authority that you need. But there's also value in community and structure and support. Amen. Amen. Be careful when you get yourself involved with an individual who declares to be a prophet or an apostle or a teacher or a preacher or an evangelist and they're not connected to a local church. Amen. Amen. Autonomy is not biblical. It's dangerous. These disciples, these two disciples, are operating under Jesus' authority to go and get that coat. Had these two old boys gone out on their own, what would have happened? Well, they would have been arrested for theft. They were no longer operating under the spiritual authority of God's Word. I want you to be careful in these perilous times. I want you to be careful in this age of digital information, misinformation. And I heard a new term, dismiss information. I don't even know what that means, but I know it's demonic. 
Mark 11, 4. So they went their way and found the coat tied by the door outside on the street, and they loosed it. But some of those who stood there and said to them, what are you doing loosening the coat? And they spoke to them just, just as Jesus had commanded. So they let him go. You see, in the Greek, when it says they went their way, they went their way. Jesus gives them free will. You go your way. But you know what way was their way? Their way was Jesus' way. You see, they didn't veer to the left. They didn't veer to the right. They didn't go, well, if he's going to be the, the triumphant Messiah coming in on a big parade, like he needs something cooler than a baby donkey. We're going to go find him a stallion or maybe a zebra. But come on, a donkey? No, you see what these boys did? Their way was God's way. God's way is the only way. You see, because they were in God's will, they were able to find what they were assigned to do. They were able to find that door, that thorough, that opportunity. They exercised their authority in Jesus to loose that opportunity from captivity. And they found favor in doing so, so they were able to what? Bring it. They were able to bring it. Because they were operating under the authority, the legal jurisdiction of God's word. Mark 11, 5 says, But some of those who stood there said to them, What are you doing loosening the coat? In the Greek, those, it says those who stood, it's histemi, to stand, to stop, to be firm. You will find resistance and skepticism. Don't argue your opinion. Simply share God's word. Your opinion, your charisma, your skill, your personality is not what transforms life. It is simply the word of the Lord. Mark eleven six, 6. And they spoke to them just as Jesus had commanded. So they let them go. It's not your opinion or your feelings, but God's word that opens doors. It sets captives free. It releases opportunities from bondage. Speak the name of Jesus into all things to loose his mercy and favor. Not you begging, not you pleading, not whipping yourself with your own cat of nine tails. Simply speak the word of the Lord. And a lot of times we feel, well, is it enough? I can tell you, if the word of the Lord is not enough, then nothing ever is enough. God's word is good enough. Save yourself the arguments, the aggravation, the agitation. You see, the demonic world doesn't get tired. They don't sleep. They don't rest. They don't need a five-minute transition in between worship and service. Don't argue with demonic forces. Simply share the word of the Lord. Mark eleven seven says, Then they brought the coat to, Jer- uh, to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. Now, this is not an overly spiritual act. From a practical side, riding a donkey is not like riding a horse. I don't know if you ever went to the bottom of the Grand Canyon on the back of a donkey, but it is a very long ride down. You see, their backs are flat, and their little rigid spines, it sticks out through the back. It is very uncomfortable to bareback ride a donkey. More so a coat. I'd have to imagine they've, they've not had seasons of fattening up. So their skeletal system is probably pretty profound and protruded. So these brothers, when they're throwing their coats, their garments, it's just a simple act of kindness and sacrifice to offer their own garments to comfort their friend Jesus. We get to Mark eleven eight, 8, and now it says, Many spread their clothes on, on the road. Now he's coming into Jerusalem. And others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. You see, this is an equipping moment for the church. Jesus has now left the place of fruitlessness and affliction from Bethpage and Bethany. 
he is now entering towards his destiny of glory. You see, there's an appointed time for every season. God is making preparations in you and for you to work through you in every season. Don't rush those seasons. Now, I'll tell you, when, when the kids, Ava's the baker of the family, Leah taught her, when Ava makes chocolate chip cookies that I don't eat anymore, but I always told her, I said, Ava, take them out of the oven a little early. No, no, no. I said, yeah, they're exothermic, which means they, they cook from within their own heat. I said, I'm giving you a clue, and now I'm giving you an order. Take those delicious chocolate chip cookies out of the oven a little early so they don't get too hard. <laughs> what I was teaching her is there's a timing in everything. I want, you to, I want you to understand, whatever your season is right now, that God is making preparations yes. in you Amen. and for you to work through you. Do not abandon where you are in search of where you think you should be until God releases you. What I will share with you is that colt, that donkey, had to be born and mature enough to carry Jesus into Jerusalem. The disciples had to be mature enough to be sent out on their own way and only do God's will. The men who resisted the disciples had to have their hearts softened first for the arrival of the Messiah. Jesus had to be prepared to press into a season of suffering prior to his glorious resurrection. And now the people, they had to grow hungry to receive Christ the King. You see, God will work all things for good. We know this because of Romans 8, 28. And, he, and this is the in, uh, New King James. And we know all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. Trust that in all things, God works for good. Not all things are good, but God will use all things for good. I will challenge you. Will you remain in season to receive the fruit of His goodness? Will you remain in season as you learn to bind, loose, and bring it? Will you remain in season? Mark eleven eight. And many spread their clothes on the road. Remember we talked last week about, about Bart, Bartimaeus when he cast off his garment. I've shared with you all throughout Scripture, uh, states of dress and undress are, are also symbolic of the way you come before the Lord. When Adam and Eve sinned, they were already naked. They were transparent. What did they do? They hid themselves. When Bartimaeus came before the Lord, he cast off his cloak. When these people are standing before the Lord, when they're standing before their new king, they take off the garments, probably the only thing they own, and they lay it before the Lord. What they're doing is they're saying, we give you all that we have and all that we need. Remember, they, on the road, in the Greek, the word road is hodos. It is, a, it is a system of doctrine, a belief, a way of Christian faith. They are laying all they have before the coming Messiah. They are saying, we are laying ourselves in agreement with your doctrine, with your belief, with your way of life. You see, although the people didn't completely even understand who Jesus was, they were willing to submit to him as king. Does this sound like last week with Bartimaeus? A beggar at the gates on the road? He didn't fully know who Jesus was. But he put himself in the right position to have an encounter with the living God. These people are there preparing for the fast, uh, Passover. They may not even fully realize who Jesus is. But they put themselves on the road. They put themselves on the path. They bring themselves to gatherings of the saints, to Bible studies. If you're just struggling a little bit and feel like I don't have it all figured out, just plant yourself for an encounter with the living God. 
Now, I want to share with you in the Greek, when it talks about a large crowd, do you remember the word that we've talked about all through the Gospel of Mark? What is the Greek word for a large crowd, a multitude? It's aklos. Large crowd, a confused crowd. What I will tell you, this is not the word that's used to describe this crowd. This was not a confused multitude. I would venture to say that their eyes are on Jesus. They are watching the coming Messiah. They may not 100% have it figured out, but they're not confused in where their eyes belong. You see, they're in a moment of total surrender. They're on the hodos. They're on the road, the way, the path to coming, becoming enlightened. They're not confused about doctrine because they're focused on King Jesus. Mark 11, 8 continues, And others cut down leafy branches and trees and spread them on the road. Now, these are palm branches that we're referring to. The reason that they use palm branches, date branches, palm leaves, they can grow up to 50 feet high. And they were used, even to the Old Testament, to symbolize joy in the Feast of Tabernacles. The Israelites, they would use palm branches to celebrate the Lord. They were also used to, to celebrate victory. Laying down palm branches was like rolling out the red carpet. You see, the colt, although Jesus intentionally arrived on a colt, that was to fulfill prophecy. Most people thought he was a worldly king coming to overthrow Rome. But if you knew the word of the Lord, you would know the Old Testament scripture that says from Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, and he is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey. Wait, not just a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. You think if Zechariah 9 9 was the first thing in their mind, and they see Jesus coming, lowly, humble, He's got the credentials. He's sharing the gospel. He's healing. He's delivering. And he's fulfilling prophecy. This is why it's so important for us to know God's word. To know God's word. Scott asked earlier, have you been watching the Olympics? I've not. I'm not. Have I caught a lot of the news feeds on the periphery about this boxer? I have. Is it a man? Is it a fe... Ah! But think, a year ago or so, they appointed someone to the Supreme Court who could not define what a woman was. Her words are, I am not a biologist. Because of a boxing match in another country, the globe has become what? Biologist. I have heard more about X and Y chromosomes and biology and that I've ever, ever studied in all my years of schooling. Immediately the world is flooded with biologists. What they're flooded with is a demonic argument that is discouraging and dissuading you from the word of the Lord. You've got to know God's word. You've got to know these are perilous times that we're coming into. These are perilous times that we're coming into. Do not fall prey to the solo rogue actors, the false teachers, the demonic prophets. Church, the Lord called us to grow a warrior culture, and that warrior culture understands the language of war. That language of war is the word of the Lord. Our weapons of war are our prayers. Mark 11, 9 says, Then those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! I will tell you that Jesus is surrounded by people. It was mass hysteria. The people had expectations. I will tell you, they also came to see Lazarus. This guy was dead? And now he's alive? I got to see this dude. 
What were the other leaders doing? We've got to kill that old boy. We've got to put him back in the ground. And now you've got Jesus. You see, the, the higher his elevation grew in his ministry, it didn't endear him deeper to more people. It was mass hysteria when he came riding in on this coat. When the, and the Greek word said, and people cried out. The Greek word is krazo. To cry for vengeance. To cry for supplication. Do you see the bipolar nature of this word? Some are crying out for supplication. Save us! Rescue us! Others are calling out for vengeance. Death to the Roman government. Death. That doesn't sound anything like the fruits of the Spirit. You see, without God's word for stability, without a renewed mind, people are going to sway in their emotional responses. They're going to experience hope and fear and happy and anger and elation and depression. Without the word of the Lord, there's no stability. They're calling out to Jesus to save them, to help them. But they also want vengeance against Rome. And they want salvation. Not eternal salvation. They want a rebirthed kingdom of David. They want a worldly renewal of the once glorious Israel. And they still believe that the Messiah who is on a lowly coat is here to conquer the great Roman Empire. When they yell Hosanna in the Hebrew, it means to save us, we pray. It's like yelling, stop! When something bad's about to happen. This is what they're yelling. It's desperation to save us. Mark 11.10, blessed is the kingdom of our father David. You see, the people are aware of the Old Testament prophecy. They understand the significance of referring to King David. Just like blind, well now he's got sight, Bartimaeus. Have mercy on me, O son of David. They recognize 2 Samuel 7, 16. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. Jesus is the fruit of the seed of King David. But you see, with all the fanfare, crying out, laying out the red carpet, taking off their garments and laying it before the Lord, Just a few days later, what do they yell? Crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify him. Do you see what emotion does for you? Do you see how unstable it is to operate in your emotion? You see, if Jesus does not do what the sinner wants him to do, the sinner will always turn on Jesus. If Jesus does not do what the sinner wants Jesus to do, the sinner will always turn on Jesus. Some are expecting Jesus to set up an earthly kingdom like David. Without a relationship with Jesus, you cannot fully understand who he is or what he came to do. Your imagination of who you think Jesus is, you're only carving a false idol of what you expect God to be. Your crisis becomes your God. Your need at the moment becomes your golden calf. I will encourage you, let God be who he says he is. It is so simple. Let God be who he says he is. Mark eleven eleven, And Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. So when he had looked around at all things, as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. What I will tell you, and I'm not making light, but I find this to be kind of funny. Like Jesus just arrived in this grand procession. People's garments were thrown. They laid palm branches across the way. They were declaring him king and Messiah. Like you'd think there'd be like a, a speech or a meal or some kind of ceremony. 
but he simply enters the temple. And he looks around and he leaves. I will tell you that the reality is that this coronation was not a legitimate coronation. The people cannot coronate Jesus as king. Only God sets up kingdoms. You see, sometimes all God wants you to do is to just show up. No lights, no microphones, no Wi-Fi. Just be present. Just be present. Is there more to Jesus' entry into Jerusalem? Yes. Yes. We are moving into the last week of Jesus' life on earth. But that's going to happen in God's timing. You moving out of whatever season of obscurity you're in right now, whatever season of barrenness you're in right now, if you feel like you're in between the villages of, of faithlessness and affliction, God is working in you to prepare something for you in God's timing if you're willing to show up if you're willing to wait on God's timing and if you're willing to glorify the Lord in whatever season you're in so I want to share the one thing that the Lord put on my heart is I want you to learn to bind and loose and bring it I want you to learn to bind up debt, bind up poverty, bind up sickness, bind up fear, bind up depression, bind up hesitation, bind up what you worry about that other people think about you. I want you to learn to bind that up in Jesus' name. I want you to have the freedom and the boldness to loose provision to lose health, to lose abundance, to lose boldness, to lose the spiritual fruit. Do yourself a favor this week. Read the scripture. Look at what the fruits of the Spirit are and ask yourself, are these fruits exhibited in my life? I encourage you to lose the spiritual gifts. And if you take anything away from today, learn to bring it. Learn to bring it with you from this season into the next. Whatever those abundant blessings are, we will catch a little bit of a break. Oh, thank you, Jesus. My fever broke. And we leave healing behind as we move into our next situation. I will tell you, that I have been slain in the Spirit all week by the revelation from the Holy Spirit to bind, to loose, to bring it. You put the blessings of the Lord like a spiritual knapsack on your back and you bring these blessings with you into the next season. And it will change and transform your life. So I thank you, Lord, for that word. If we can stand as the body, I want, to, I want to open an invitation and I won't ask to come forward. I will just ask you to, to close your eyes where you are and it's not to be overly spiritual. I just don't want you to be distracted by what's going on on either side of you. I want you to create a space between uh, you and, and for you and the Holy Spirit. If you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, take this opportunity to just ask the Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? And then I want you to, to just remain receptive to hearing the word that the Lord has for you. And if you've not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you're willing to make that decision today, I simply ask you to, to, to raise your hand or nod your head or And if you've made that decision, I encourage you, we're going to keep the altar open after our prayer and closing and to come up and receive prayer. But 
I just want you to, to spend a moment with your eyes closed as I pray us out and simply ask the Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? Allow him to speak. Lord, we thank you, Father. Lord, we thank you for this good gospel message. I'm so grateful that for the last year we have, we have walked side by side studying the life of Jesus and his disciples. I pray that, as Scott Holbert was talking about earlier, or I'm sorry, Joe, our elder Joe Hernandez, about the weight, the gravity, that we should all begin to feel the gravity of what Jesus is entering into. Not sadness. He's doing his Father's will. But we should begin to feel the weight, the gravity, the seriousness of what's happening Jesus is entering into the last week of his life on this earth. I'm, I pray, Lord, that, that from this point forward till we finish this gospel message, that we, that we continue, that we press in to the anchor scripture for the week coming. I pray that, that no one shows up on a Sunday and oh, I didn't know we were talking about that. I pray that we carry, that we receive the weight, the gravity of this last week. This is the gospel message. This is the hope of salvation. This is what makes life eternal with God possible. So Lord, I I pray for this body. I pray for the families here. I pray for the the families that are still traveling and preparing for back to school. I pray a special provision, a special gravity of anointing be, be placed upon them. Lord, I pray that they that a new hunger, that you that you blow a fresh wind across their coals, a new desire to know your word. that they stop wasting time researching X and Y chromosomes and biology and this, and they start researching your word. They start reading your word. That they put your word in their hearts, in their heads, so it radiates from their mouth, in their lives, in their prayers. We are coming into a perilous, perilous time, and I thank you for allowing this church, calling this church, Our assignment is to grow a warrior culture of godly leaders to lead in ungodly times. And Lord, we are in ungodly times. So I pray for this body of spiritual warriors. I pray a special blessing, an anointing over them, a covering over them in their individual ministries. Lord, we are so thankful for your son, Jesus Christ. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.